All right. Oh, sorry. This is yours. Right. So, first, you're probably thinking like, oh, do we need more surveillance? And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I'll answer why we need it. <laughs> right. Uh, I think in Denmark we 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 don't really consider it. Uh, as a thing we're just like yeah go ahead uh, of course we need to you know look at the ships and what they're doing okay so the entire thing is kind of based on this system called automatic identification system it's basically a ship gps signal and all the ships they transpond a signal about their location uh, where they're going uh, their speed their course and their most importantly their position and also their identity. So you can actually you know where a ship is. The problem is that this uh, AIS, it's like old as system. And uh, it was it's mainly used for tankers so they don't collide. And this means that the system is not very robust. There's a lot of errors in it. Uh, it can be turned off. You can spoof it. That means that you can you can just pretend to be somewhere else, basically. Uh, and and there's no like there's no sea police coming out to, to stop you if you do if you break any rules here. I mean, every every larger vessel is supposed to have one of these transmitters on it. Every smaller vessel, they typically have it because when people go out in their sa uh, sailing ship, they want to know, you know, where they're going and they want to see everybody else. So they have a receiver and a transmitter as well. Uh, yeah, and what you see here is a fisherman uh, who's sailing around south of Madagascar. And he's actually going into like a UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, to catch tuna. And uh, he actually got caught doing this uh, by some uh, island nation out there, uh, the Kiribati Island Nation. And they actually uh, got him to pay a lot of money because he had he was uh, he actually had his uh, AIS transponder on. So we got this signal, and we could prove that uh, they were like not I, but they could prove in a court of law that he was there catching tuna. So the next time he'll just turn off his transponder when he goes there. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> an easy way to bypass the system. Uh, so these uh, ships, when they turn off their transponder, when they spoof their signal, when they behave in a weird way, we call them dark ships because they kind of go dark. All right. In Denmark, Greenland is a part of the, the Danish uh, uh, kingdom, right? The kingdom of Denmark. Uh, that means that we have a very, very, very large territory of water that is, uh, yeah, we're supposed to monitor. And uh, Denmark is very small, and we don't have a huge navy or military. So uh, we kind of focus on uh, science and satellite imagery to monitor these waters. Uh, and with the climate change, suddenly people can sail through the Arctic. Like before it was icy, <laughs> there was not need, a, a, bit, a large need for like monitoring these waters because nobody would go there. Now, people start sailing there. And uh, here's a Russian uh, tanker that uh, sails. Of course, it's allowed to sail near the Russian uh, coast, of course. But some of the other routes that are more direct, uh, they, they come close to Greenland. Uh, yeah. uh, here is a Russian warship in Skane. Uh, and uh, it is this is Skane. Uh, if you don't know, if you didn't know where Skane was. So this is not actually a warship, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, it's a science vessel that was anchored in Skane. But suddenly, uh, people, they noticed that there was a signal from a Russian warship there. And they just, they changed their identity and just transmitted a signal as if they were 
uh, Russian warship. So suddenly uh, people looked all the newspapers, they were like, what the hell is going on? And they called our group and like, what's going on? Why is there a Russian warship? And it wasn't a warship, but that's kind of the, the deal that if you if you had eyes on the ground, you could tell that's not a warship and or at least that the warship was not there. Here's, uh, it's not just the Russians, this is uh, the, the British, the British Navy that spoofs. So it's become kind of like a, uh, you know, intelligence, counterintelligence thing, where now everybody spoofs their, their transponders so they don't get uh, caught or like, so the enemies don't know where they are. I mean, it's it doesn't really, it's not a nice thing to take your Navy and then sail to Russia. And then the Russians are like, oh, they're coming, right? Mm -hmm. And then can tell that they're coming. Um, yeah. So this is, of course, the case I mentioned before, where the ocean is so big that it's impossible to enforce anything. Uh, and that's why you kind of need the eyes from the sky to see that there are boats where they are, where they're telling that they are, or where they are not. And uh, especially when it comes to like fishing, this uh, is actually from uh, something called Global Fishing Watch, which uh, maybe you know it. It's like a sponsored uh, uh, organization that tries to stop illegal fishing. Um, of course, there's oil spills. I was actually looking at a satellite image from uh, from uh, the coast of Houston, just off. I was like, "Whoa, wait a minute!" That's so much oil in the water i i wasn't aware of the, yeah that it was that you know usually it's kind of difficult to find these oil spills but uh, apparently not over here uh, yeah uh, yeah and uh, of course we have the pirates uh, which not doesn't more look like this actually uh, so this is actually uh, we worked with the Norwegian ins uh, Norwegian insurance company. They have a lot of uh, sh ships sailing through uh, the Bay of Guinea in Africa, and um, so they they want to uh, insure the the ships. But the problem is that there are actually companies in Britain uh, that sell data to the pirates, so the pirates know where to go and look for the ships. Uh, yeah, who would have guessed, right? Uh, uh, so, so the, the pirates are, you know, one step ahead right now. And the way it works is that the, these pirates they sail out. They sail out. Maybe I'm, yeah, here they sail out. So, as you can see, there's like a line that bypasses the coast uh, here, and that's where all the tankers are, all the the, the cargo ships. And the way the pirates, they sail out, then they wait. There's like a mothership and the pirates, they go out in smaller boats. And then they just sit out there and wait for the, the big ships to come. And then they see if they can, you know, take some hostages. And usually a lot of the piracy is like on fishermen, because at some time the pirates, they don't have enough gas, gas in their tank. So they, they take over fishing vessels. To also get some food yeah uh, all right so we'll talk a bit about the data that we use so of course i already mentioned this uh, ais system and then we use uh, satellite imagery of a various kind we use radio frequency satellites that's satellites that just listen to radio signals so that could be like satellite phones uh yeah and not ais signals so if you turn off your AIS, but you call somebody, uh, then we can still uh, like monitor you and we know where you are. And then we're also looking into like radio frequency interference. And uh, yeah, I'll show that what that is. Uh, all right. So these AIS, I already mentioned it, uh, but ships are transmitting these signals all over the place. And um, Typically, they'll also mention what, where they're going, uh, where they come from, uh, what their uh, arrival, uh, uh, the time of their arrival. Uh, yeah. And so one of the problems with AIS is that the coverage 
is like very, very sparse some, in some areas. Uh, once you get out to like the far uh, reaches of the ocean, uh, it's very difficult to, um, yeah, some of the signals, they just get lost. And uh, if you notice here on the left, on the right side, you can see in Asia, in like the Singapore area, there's a lot of lost signals. And that has to do with the, the figure on the, the left side is that the AIS, it kind of works in that it divides a cell into like a, a, a lot of mini cells. But in those mini cells, the ships are only allowed, one ship is only allowed to transmit one signal at a time. So if, some, if there's two ships in one of these cells, which can be large, one of them will just be uh, removed basically or disappear. Uh, yeah, uh, a little bit about optical satellites. I mean, they're kind of straightforward. Forward. Uh, yeah, we use the, the Sentinel-2 primarily because it's free. Uh, yeah, and these are images from uh, the Sentinel-2 satellite. Uh, yeah, and uh, we also have some of the Maxa uh, images. Uh, which are really, really high resolution. They're super cool to look at. And uh, and uh, for like a future work, they might be like real nice because these, you can actually tell which ship is which on this, which is uh, now we get into like facial recognition and stuff, right? Just for ships. Uh, um, so one of the problems with the, the optical images is that they're cloudy very often. Uh, in the Arctic, the winter gets very dark so you cannot use them for like part of the year i know insa also has this problem right uh, yeah so so that's why we we mainly focus on the synthetic aperture radar satellites uh, which don't have any of these problems and here we use the 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 sentinel one but also we are looking at starting the terrasa x which is, has better resolution. The sensor one is a very low resolution compared. I mean, you can see some of the, in the insert, uh, you can see the ships and these are like large tankers. They are very small here. Uh, so the radio frequency, it kind of looks like at this on the right. Here we overlaid uh, AIS, which is the orange, uh, the, no, the AIS is the gray, the orange is the, ships in a SAR image and the red is these uh, radio frequency uh, locations. So it's basically a location where we pick up some uh, signal from a boat. And ideally they would all match up, right? Uh, so when we start to get into uh, interference, and you'll probably notice this, this is in the, in the, the Middle East, and what you have here is, um, this is two Sentinel-1 images that are overlaid with different color. And what happens is that the satellite, it comes from one direction on the ascending uh, path. It takes an image or it makes a recording. Then it comes again four days later on the descending uh, path and it does it again. And what happens is that because it's a radio, uh, radio satellite, when it, uh, when it uh, receives uh, its signal, sometimes there'll be a, uh, a radio transmitter on the ground, which beams up, which scans the sky, in this case for missiles, and it'll make these interference patterns in the image. So here we can, we can actually see where all the American Patriot missile, missile systems are uh, in, the missile, in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, and also in uh, like uh, near Israel and stuff. There's a lot. Sweden has a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, here's it of Denmark. Uh, what you see is there's also a lot, and you can kind of correlate them to these uh, uh, military ships. If there's a if there's a radio frequency interference on the ocean, it's basically always a military ship. So that's what we use them for, right? Uh, the bottom one, that's a Japanese uh, aircraft carrier south of Japan, which coincidentally is located right in the, 
right in the interference strip, you get these kind of patterns. Uh, yeah. All right. <coughs> So we primarily work with deep learning algorithms uh, on these uh, uh, satellite images. And to do that, we create data sets. And I'll quickly mention how we do it. Uh, but it, it's basically like we take, an, uh, we take a, a, an image, we overlay it with the, with the AIS data, and then we inter interpolate the AIS data and uh, remove windmills, which is a problem here in Europe that is all over the ocean. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, it's crazy. We have to remove them because we'll get so many false alarms. And then we get something like this. This is the Gibraltar Strait, uh, where we can, uh, we can match all the ships that we detect in the image. We run like a ship detection algorithm. And we just match them up with all the AIS signals. And what we basically have is a, it's like a, a positive unlabeled problem where, where we have a lot of uh, ships. We detect a lot of ships, but we don't know which one of them are true ships because only so many of them have an AIS signal. And there are also some that don't have one. So it's always like we have the ships that we know are ships with the AIS correlated ships then we have the ships we don't know our ships but we guess our ships or their noise it depends um yeah so radar images are kind of noisy uh, at times so the number of ships that you detect is very much dependent on how low in the noise did you want to go uh, yeah and especially for smaller ships the sentinel one has like 20 meter resolution uh, which is uh, very very low when it comes to like ships. Most ships are, or most smaller ships are uh, lower or, or, or smaller than 20 meters. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, we use deep learning. So here is a, it's a, it's an image of four ships and two of them are kind of small. And so the idea is like, why, why do we use deep learning? It's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically like a feature extractor. We want to know which, which of the, these are ships. Like if I asked you uh, which of these are ships or which of these are like icebergs, for example, then probably the one with the one, number one, you would be like, oh yeah, that's a ship. Uh, yeah. And the two above you will probably be like, oh, I, I'm not in, entirely sure. Now, if I ask you which direction are these ships sailing, then it's like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe the the bottom one is sailing in something like 120 degrees uh, clockwise uh, from the north, right? Uh, but the other three are like, hmm, I'm not entirely sure. What if I ask you, like, what's the velocity of these ships from the Then you would be like, huh, <laughs> I don't know. That's a, a bit. Uh, more difficult uh, to, to figure out. Uh, yeah, so I should probably like, who, who has an understanding of deep learning here? <laughs> all right, all right. I'll just give a, a, a quick rundown, a quick one rundown. So basically some guy uh, showed in a study that if you take a, a, a lot of um, nonlinear functions, you, you had a universal uh, function approximator. So you just combine a lot of the nonlinear function, you could approximate something. So what, what deep learning kind of does in this scenario is that you take the image, then you apply a lot of nonlinear functions to it, uh, typically like convolutions. And then you have your model parameters, which are weights of this, and you just, you get like a series of, uh, of outputs and you match them to like what the true value is. And then you can minimize this long loss function and adjust the weights of, uh, of your model in like a short uh, description. Yeah. 
uh, to get to improve your output of the of the yeah, of the model. Um, yeah, I'll uh, go into some case studies. All right. All right. So here's an image of uh, South Africa. It's Port, it's Cape Town up to the right. And what you see in the insert is that there are two tracks, AIS tracks, and there's two ships. And there's kind of this smear near the ships, uh, which kind of offsets the ship from the AIS track. If you draw a straight line through the AIS track, it would like match where the smear is and not where the ship is. And this happens because the, the ship is uh, sailing at a velocity uh, once, and the satellite is also moving at a velocity. And the way the, the synthetic aperture radar satellite works is that it, it, it sends like multiple, um, multiple uh, uh, waves and receives them again. Because the ship is also moving, there's like a shift in the, the Doppler frequency that you receive back. And when you when you focus the image, you get this smear, um, which is, is just, just like a Doppler, Doppler thing, Doppler signal. Uh, and uh, there's a very nice equation to kind of figure out what this uh, what this uh, what the distance distances of this. Um, uh, Doppler smear, and what you see is that you kind of have the the distance of the this um, the offset of the ship. Then you have the velocity, which here is SOG. It stands for speed over ground, and you have the COG, which is the course over ground. So the speed is uh, related to this offset. So you can actually measure the velocity of ships just from a synthetic avatar radar image. You can also do it from an optical image because of the wave, uh, yeah, like just from the Kelvin wave pattern. Um, yeah, and as I talked about, once you kind of get these large data sets of like 30,000 uh, ships, you start to notice how faulty the AIS signal is. And that's why there's so much difference uh, you have these very nasty errors uh, that I'm showing here and they are in gray. And we can kind of estimate them, uh, which are in uh, in red. That's what we predict versus the ground truth. And in uh, in gray is kind of the, the the error of just the just the AIS signal. And in the in the on the right side, the course of the ship is a uh, it's extremely erroneous. And that's because once ships, they slow down, they start to drift. So their AIS signal, uh, their course in the AIS signal is not the same as the heading of the ship, which is the, the, the direction the ship is pointing versus uh, which direction it's uh, moving. And this makes it very, very difficult to train these um, uh, neural networks because you have such a large error. That it's very difficult for like, uh, um, for the networks to learn anything. Uh, and uh, another problem is that if you look at ship sailing patterns, then often you'll see that they only go in one or two directions. It's very rare that ships. Uh, uh, I mean, you have to you have to aggregate a lot of satellite images to get ships going in all directions. Because in any given uh, image, they'll only go in like one or two directions, like the either back or forth, uh, or up or down, or at some curvature. Uh, yeah. So this also gives that the data, uh, just the image data set that you use, will have very very strong um, like spikes or like very strong groupings in the data. That'll also cause the any models to very quickly um, overfit these groups. Um, yeah. And uh, here is kind of you know the what um, this is the ship position in in the satellite image, 
versus the AIS signal, and that what we predict is the, the, the offset of the ship. So it should be a straight line, and you get these very large errors on it. This, yeah. And the, the, the central line in the middle at zero, that is all the stationary ships. So there's an associated error with those as well. Uh, what you get when you uh, run some uh, models and try to predict, predict the velocity, we get this nice sine curve, which is, stems from the equation I, you saw before. <laughs> and you can see that when ships, they sail fast, they get, there's a large offset or large smear pattern. And when they sail slow, there's a small smear pattern. And here's how the how the the output of our algorithm uh, looks like. You can see there's a ship in which direction it's uh, sailing, and you can see the location of the smear. So just by by uh, just by extracting the direction the ship is sailing and the location of the 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 smear, which is this, it's not a smear. It's a it's the wake of the ship, uh, actually. Uh, because it's only the ship that's sailing, not the wake. The wake is not moving. So only the ship is like displaced from its wake. Uh, um, yeah, so from these, you can get the velocity of the ship. And uh, here, of course, uh, you we estimate two parameters at the same time. So in order to do that, we have to combine the losses. Uh, it's called multitask deep learning. We combine the losses. So the loss from the estimating the cause of the ship and the loss from estimating the position of the ship wake or the smear uh, by uh, normalizing them with the, the error, uh, the associated error of uh, the variables. And if you, if you do that, then the network will not overfit uh, any, of the, any of the parameters. Let's say that the, like one of these, uh, Eros was very low uh, compared to its actual error. Then one of the losses would be very much uh, would be very larger than the other one, and the model would focus on minimizing that loss and not the other one. So we would have very quickly, um, you would probably get a model that was overfitted to one variable and didn't know how to predict the other one. Uh, yeah. So um, so of course the velocity. Because it's dependent on the, the course of the ship, it's impossible to predict it uh, at when the ship is sailing parallel in the image, because then there's no offset from the wake. Uh, all right, let's move on to icebergs. So in these uh, radar images, it's very difficult to tell the difference between icebergs and ships, which is a very big problem up in the Arctic region. Here is a, it's basically the same image I showed in uh, of the ship old task, right? But here you have it for the Disco Bay in Greenland. So to the right of this image is the Illulisiat uh, glacier. Um, so one of the kind of funny, tragic things about uh, about this is that the Sentinel One satellite constellation. They have two, they work in two polarizations. One is H or horizontal uh, emitted, and the other is vertical emitted. And in the Arctic, because a horizontal emitted uh, polarization is better for ice and snow, uh, it changes to that. And everywhere else in the world, it works in the vertical uh, transmitting uh, polarization, which is a problem because there are very few ships and many icebergs in the Arctic and elsewhere in the world, like in uh, the English Strait, there are many ships and no icebergs. Uh, so to create these data sets, uh, you either need a lot of uh, images uh, of um, the Arctic region, uh, where there are very few ships, or you need 
some kind of happenstance which actually happened so apparently when they just launched the satellite uh, it was uh, operating in the horizontal emitted uh, polarization everywhere in the world just for the first year so we went back and got those images and uh, ais days are from that time and there are very few so uh, yeah we were able to create a data set which is uh, yeah other people uh, kind of want uh, because it it's a thing that doesn't really exist but as you see there's very few um, ships in the arctic the greenland people they don't actually like that we are looking for them they just want to fish in peace <laughs> uh, yeah and what we get is kind of well, I, we, we annotate the ships and the icebergs, and then we make predictions. So what, where we are kind of is that once you get down to very small ships, it's so difficult to tell the difference. Uh, and especially, especially the ships that are sailing close to icebergs, which is the bottom right, the bottom right ship on the left, on the right side, uh, it's, it gets very difficult to tell the difference uh, between ships and icebergs. And that's kind of where we are right now on um, this. All right. Another thing we are going is a traje trajectory predi prediction of ships. So this is, can be done just from the AIS data because it's basically a very nice data set to have. Um, so here we use a, this is a like an LSTM model. And what it does is it predicts like a, a probability density of where the ship is going. And then we, we sample from that uh, probability density and then further predict and sample and further predict and sample. And what it does is that we get these uh, diverging trajectories compared to if you just had used um, like least squares uh, and always, uh, um, always taking the best predicted future position you would get like one straight line versus uh, multiple different ones. So we can estimate like, oh, we think the ship is going here or, or like maybe it's going over here or here or here. So several different uh, possible, uh, pro probable uh, directions that the ship is going. So in this case, uh, what you see is that the blue line is the least squares uh, pro approximation. Uh, so that is uh, the highest probability route of the ship, while the ship actually goes in the green, the green track. And uh, if you use this kind of um, sampling style, uh, then you also get that, um, that uh, direction as a possible path. And it's very nice when you, when you consider uh, that there are a lot of places in the world where the ship has kind of two options. It goes to, for example, like we consider a ship that sails in the Danish waters, then at some point it, it's either going north or it's going south. Uh, for example, if there's an island or something. Uh, so if you want to know where a ship is going or like if you want to predict where a ship is going and then it goes dark and you want to have satellite vision on the ship, then you're kind of, okay, we need it here or there. Um, We also do like port predictions. So where the ship is going. And you'd think that this is kind of, um, uh, it's already in the AI signal because they already mentioned where they're going and where they're coming from. But it turns out that uh, they don't. <laughs> they, they very rarely, uh, you know, um, they often don't specify the exact port name uh, sometimes they make a mistake. Sometimes they don't update the, the, the destination. And sometimes they have an error in their ETA, which makes it extremely difficult to pre predict using, um, using machine learning as well. Because you basically have a, have a variable that is either true or false. Uh, Uh, yeah, but the interesting thing is that it's it works actually pretty well, and people probably will expect it because the ships are basically sailing on highways. 
And then once they arrive near a port, they'll deviate from the highway. Which is kind of so people would expect that you could not predict where it was going until it started deviating, but that's actually uh, possible. Yeah, and as I mentioned, what we're working on is uh, this kind of facial recognition for ships, basically that we can we can tell ships apart, we can tell their identity apart, and we can do that because we actually have their identity. It's given in the AI signal. Uh, so this will be coming uh, sometime in the future. All right. Any questions? No, oh, that's forty minutes. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Do we have any questions in the room, or if you're online, you can close your hand. Yeah. Question. Yes, I want to ask what is the, the prediction of the, the different mode, the identification of the image, whether or not there is a ship, or you also need to uh, predict the location of the ship or the direction, velocity, all of them. So it depends, it depends which one you mean, but this one, the output of the model is the it's basically the, the the red circle and the red arrow. You can directly output the location of the machine and also the. No, I don't. I don't output the. Well, I technically output the direct the position of the ship, but I I I I output the position of the ship wake, oh. which is offset from the ship. The ship position is given from the data set because. I've ran a ship detection algorithm, which identifies the position of the ship. So of course, there's some error in that as well, because the ship detection algorithm will typically find the ship um, stern, I think it's called, the one the where, where the ship is big or the, like tall, because the SAR signal bounces off that uh, typically has the largest reflectivity. So for those images, you already know there is a ship? Yes. Yeah, because they're correlated with an AIS signal. So I know because there's an AIS signal right there and there's a ship there, then I know it's a ship with AIS. Or at least, yeah, in theory, I don't have, I didn't, I don't go through my data set and visualize it, but yeah. Yeah, so when you uh, use the, for the iceberg, do you have like the vertical um, satellite data to like sort of work out where everything was for that first year? I think. So. Uh, this one? Uh, yeah. Um, so when it, so, so now is it in a different polarization? You said it's in the Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So how does it, the, what, so, does it work now still pretty well or is it? So, so what happened is that the, the Sentinel-1 satellite constellation consists of two satellites. In the Arctic, they switch to HHHV polarization. So they transmit a horizontally polarized radio wave and receives both polarizations. Uh, and if you took a data set of ships, of ship images, which had a VV and VH, so vertically, transmitted uh, polarization, they would look completely different because your icebergs would always be in the HHHV polarization because all the icebergs are up in the Arctic territory. Mm -hmm. So if you combine those, you would always have a, I mean, your model would all, your deep learning model would always be 100% uh, right because it can just tell the difference between the, the polarizations and not you know, the actual uh, content of the image, right? And so, so, um, so yeah, so in the first year, you had uh, HHHV polarized images from all over the world. Not a lot, uh, but enough that you could make a data set. So those are still the same. 
right? So if I wanted to go out and tell the difference between chips and icebergs today, I could train a model on that data set and it would work in the in the in the Arctic. Do we have any more questions? Go ahead. I have so many questions. Right, go ahead. But one is, I wonder, are there any, I mean, it, it kind of sounds like for like the Sentinel, this is not what they intended it to be used for. Because if people were thinking about like chip detection, they would think like, oh, if we switch polarizations in the Arctic, we're going to have a hard time like seeing the ships. Yeah. I wonder, are there any other examples of um, like you, the ship detection is that like of interest to other communities that you maybe like didn't expect, or is like being able to monitor ships from satellites? Um, I I'm thinking about like I don't know animal migration or like what what other communities have you found yourself in conversation with after doing this work? And then I just also wonder about um, part of the motivation was around like enforcement. And uh, yeah, I guess how does how does that happen? Or um, ultimate, I guess this is just true of all kind of like satellite things. It's like this can be used for like good or can use, mm -hmm. be used for like bad and kind of good or bad maybe depends on who's looking at it. Like you mentioned with like the Greenlanders are like, why, why we don't track us, we just want to fish. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that that's really, I think that's really interesting. There's, there's not a, I'm trying to articulate a question that's wrapped up in that, but like, mm -hmm. where do you, I guess, envision that this information can go that it does help with enforcement? Or is that not helpful? Yeah. yeah. So ideally, I mean, we're scientists, right? So we're idealists and we ideally, ideally it would go towards helping people i mean even like monitoring military ships is i mean ideally we wouldn't have war right so there wouldn't be need for yeah. for ships to sail where they go uh, yeah exactly exactly but uh so a lot of the um for example if you look at the um, global fishing watch where they kind of specialize in the in the in catching fishing ships that are fishing illegally. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the ocean is kind of off limits. And um, for example, the Chinese, they have a whole fishing fleet. And what they do is they sail to Chile's coast line, just where the Chile water begins. Then they all turn off the AIC. And then they come back a couple of days later, they start broadcasting again. And the Chileans, they are like, uh, I think uh, one of our professors talked to them, they're like, um, talk about what the satellite data can do for them, how they can monitor, certainly they can monitor the rainforest, all the people doing drugs there, they didn't give a shit about that, they're like, no one at all. But when it came to the shipping, or like the fishing, illegal fishing, they were like, hell, this is a big problem for them, because they have rely on a lot of uh, fishing industry. Yeah, and it's the same with Greenland. I mean, people don't go there now, but maybe in like 10 or 30 or 20 years, people will go there and fish illegally. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's kind of difficult to go there now. Uh, also, because all the countries bordering Greenland are, you know, it's Canada, it's US, it's, it's Europe, uh, and to a certain degree, Russia, right? But if the, if the for example, the North, Northwest pass Passage, it wasn't frozen uh, at all. It would be very easy for like Chinese uh, to go there and just sail there. I mean, it's kind of like now it's uh, defended naturally by you know difficult waters and dangerous waters and icebergs. But maybe it won't be for long. Yeah. Is that um? Being able to differentiate between an iceberg and a ship, like you showed those images, I definitely just looking at them would not be able to tell the difference. Mm. Um, 
And you mentioned that this, like the data set to do this is pretty limited. What are the, um, what's the potential for improving that in the future? Does it, does that require like having a different satellite or, or changing the way that data is collected or? Yeah. I mean, the Sentinel one satellite three is coming online soon, but the Sentinel one satellite two, it went down. So more data is coming, but also we are kind of fighting, fighting with the, the polar division in Denmark, for example, because they are actually the ones that are like, we want the Arctic to be in this polarization. Yeah. Uh, but it's not a problem for other satellites. But it's just satellite data is uh, kind of difficult to come by. That's why everybody always uses the same satellites, the Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2. Um, uh, what's it called? Tropomi, uh, I think. And uh, then the Landsat satellites. It's always those. It's always, unless it's like a special, uh, it's always, yeah, it's always those. And uh, unless it's like a special case study where they, got two images from uh, the Terrasa or the Cosmo SkyMet satellite constellation. Yeah. I, mean, I would like to you know, have Maxa give us a lot of the images they have, but those are very expensive. Any more questions in the room online? Can you show me the figure that predicts where the ship is going? Yep. Yeah, this, this one. Uh, the different color represents different output of the mode, right? Uh, no. No. What What is the right color? Uh, wait, yeah, it does. So what happens is that the, the model, it predicts a probability density. Yeah. And from that, you sample one point, and then you, it's like, a, it's an LSTM model. So you basically feed the prediction back in, mm -hmm. and then it predicts another, and then you sample a point there. And if you do that, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, five times, you get three different paths, or potential paths that the potential locations this ship could, uh, should, uh, could you go. Why is it, why is it so noisy compared to the... That's because it's, it's technically a random walk, right? It's technically a random walk. And the, the thing is that if you didn't do it like that, if you just took the highest probability, you would always get the blue line, right? Which is the highest probability. So if, we, if I only had one guess, I would guess the blue line, right? Because it didn't change the direction. Like along the along the track from the from the input track, the direction. Yeah, yeah, but that's also dependent on like where which ship. So this is like south of Sweden. It's south of Sweden, and what you see is that like one of these tracks actually predicts that it goes to the harbor in the north, right? And you don't actually always get that. I was wondering why you separate the data like at the time. So at the time from all that is uh, is the input track, right? After the so the one, the black is the input track. Yes, the yeah. black. The the cross section between the black and the green. Yeah. So there is a turning point. And you, you, you split the the splitting of all the turning point is the input track, and below that is the true track. After, I mean, you didn't input that in the mode. What if, no, the true track is not in. Right, I know. What, yep. if, what if you um, gave the model some of the track after the turning point? Oh, after the, the turning point. Oh, yeah. Then it, then, it would, then it would probably predict the blue one. The thing is that, so this is like an example of, of, um, of the model. Uh, the thing is that a ship could just turn off its signal at any time, right? So this showcases why it's 
it, it's a good idea to have multiple predictions for where the ship could go instead of just one. Oh, okay. So the ideally, <laughs> no, ideally you would just follow every ship and predict where they're going. And when they start to deviate, right, or they turn off when you lose track of them, then they're like, oh, where, they, where did they go? So the right. point is to predict the possibility when you turn off the uh, radio, where they will go. Yeah, exactly. It's just for bigger stuff for a while right now, pretty much. But it's nice to be able to know where they are, you know, mm -hmm. especially if you're working out there. And can you have something on board where you can see where the ships are? I do not. Okay. You have to have a subscription, mm. I guess, to it and a special uh, receiver. But no, we do not have that. There's Gil Silver, an old skipper in Antarctica who would hate you. <laughs> yeah, it was it was funny. We went to Greenland um, to like a science uh, conference. They spend a lot of money on that in Greenland to like you know yeah. do science about Greenland. And, you know, they they were very interested in. Uh, I don't really know. But when we came and like, oh yeah, we do you know fishing ship surveillance, they were like, what do you do? <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> this captain didn't want Washington National Science Foundation ship, but he liked his freedom. He didn't want Washington to know where he was. When satellite navigation came in for the first time, he said, I don't want one of these things. <laughs> They'll know they always want to know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> That was the day that it was took nine days to get from the South Orkney Islands to the South American coast. You got one sun site in nine days. Hmm. Didn't know which, which part of the coast you hit when you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Thanks once again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're definitely doing with the cell phones as well. I mean, they can yeah. tell. Uh, yeah, it's it's getting scary, right?